Hi, I'm the Now Visitor, and you are watching Trek Culture. 2023. What a year. What a year. Um... Yeah. So look, we have plenty of ups. We have downs. You can't say it was boring. I don't think anyone's ever going to say that 2023 was a dull year. Before we go any further, I want to take a, just an opportunity to say a massive thank you from everyone here at Trek Culture for all of your support this year, all of your interaction, your comments, your likes, your shares. Seriously, it is so massively appreciated. Like because of you, we're nearly at 300,000 subscribers. I mean, that's bonkers. It feels like a community has built up very much around us in which we are a part of and we are so grateful to you so from all of us happy new year thank you so much and i suppose we should probably dig into what we do best up and down it. something that's 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 crazy right it's the start of 2023 in February, in fact, myself and the wonderful Chris met in person for the first time. Yes, we've been working together since 2020, but we actually only met in February of this year. And what's more, I live in Ireland, Chris lives in England, and we met in Los Angeles. Because, of course, we were so fortunate to be able to be invited to the premiere of Star Trek Picard, which brought us together for the first time. So up getting to meet chris that was lovely that was wonderful and it was sort of because we kind of we got there and we've spoken so much it was the case of hey how's it going? oh wait hang on this is the first time and so I, I i shocked the man with a hug he's a good hugger now another up there is the reason we met was the premiere of star trek picard this was this was incredible folks we were invited it was crazy we flew over we got to meet the wonderful jesse gender we got to meet uh so Heil starfleet boy we got to meet aaron geek filter this was incredible we got to meet terry metallus we got to meet a whole bunch of people involved in star trek something really exciting about going to the picard premiere as well of course is the location the location being near the vasquez rocks Huge, huge thanks to our good friend Matt Jennings, who effectively brought us there and brought us home and had to listen to us going on about Star Trek. He's a bit of a Trek himself, so he's not too bad, our Matt. And we got our lovely uh, video done. <sighs> For God's sake, people, if you're going to go to the desert, wear sunscreen. Daniel and Jack Lowe, thank you so much. Because of you, this plate got to me and then we got to bring it to the Vasquez Rocks as well. They've, they, they've, they've had a year, um, but they are just two of the loveliest people you could ever hope to meet. And I'm not just saying that because they sent me the plate, but it helps. And I'm gonna jump in straight away with of course Star Trek Picard. Um, so we're gonna do some rapid fire stuff. Episode one, love the fact you've got Riker in his socks. I know it sounds so silly to think about it now, now that we know everything that we do. Worf's entrance, you get that exchange between Picard and Crusher in the beginning of 17 seconds, which I think Gates McFadden has rarely been as strong. That's an up. Down, which I downed at the time and I'm downing again, is that ending scene where Riker throws Picard off the bridge. You know, it just seemed to be like, oh, even though we know where it went afterwards, and of course they have the resolution and it's lovely. It was just like, oh, that's a bit out of nowhere. A whopping up to Todd Stashwick in general, as Captain Liam Shaw, but particularly his Wolf 359 speech in the holodeck. That was harrowing. Episode five, up and down, Roll Aaron. Up, of course, down. We now know, my down is more that what we, what it could have been, what we could have had, which was discovering Roe alive and well in the Brig of the Intrepid. My headcanon now has that there. There is a universe where she is alive and well, and I choose to live in that universe. Episode six is the Fleet Yards. Enterprise A, kind of cried then, kind of crying now. You've got the Defiant, Voyager, you've got the NX-01, you've got Kronos-1, you've got the HMS Bounty, you've got the original Stargazer, and also the original Space Dog. Yeah, some of the stuff happened in the episode, but I was lost at that point. Up, Moriarty, down, oh, okay, bye. That exchange between Data and Geordi, whopper of an up. The following episode, you've got Data versus Lore. You've got the inclusion of Tasha Yar. You've got 
solids. Well, first of all, down for the following episode, it's like, oh, it's the Borg again. Okay. Now, of course, thematically, it, it, it had to be just a little Borg out. However, Hangar 12. Episode 10 saw the return of Walter Koenig to Star Trek. He was playing Anton Chekhov, which was a beautiful tribute to, of course, Anton Yelchin, who we lost in 2016, right there in the heart. Picard, overall, I loved it. Um, it is, it's given us so much nostalgia, so much, you know, fan teasing, which is wonderful. Um, I think a wee down is, Alexander and Kestra, are they okay, are they? Again, interview since has said, yes, they were doing this and they were doing that, but listen. Data flying to the Beach Boys through the Borg Cube. You had Jack done up in the Locutus gear, if you like. Uh, the return of Alice Krieg, obviously she's been in episode nine as well, but that was so much fun. There was so much to love, but big, massive honking down, down for the show overall, Laris. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's still sitting on Shell Talk 4, as far as we know. I mean, the poor woman. Sorry, yes, Orla Brady fans, ride or die. Can we get at least a coda or something where he goes, Oh, Laris, how are you getting on? I'm on my way. And she's like, it's been a while. And I would be completely remiss if I didn't turn around and say, what an up to that poker scene. It was well earned. It was 30 years in the earning. And it was earned and it was great. Overall, I thought it was a bloody solid gift for Trekkies, particularly, obviously, Next Generation and Voyager fans. The cancellation of Star Trek Discovery. What we saw here was frustration. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll speak personally for a second. When that news came through, I just went, oh, for God's sake. You know, it seems like one of those shows that, I mean, whatever else you want to say about it, people talk about it being shared in the news and it you know keeps a degree of notoriety you know i like discovery i see the issues i have seen the issues throughout i am not sticking my fingers in my ears going la 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 what i did not do and i am i am including this on a down for star trek in 2023 is dance on the grave of the show some of the discourse around star trek this year has been vile and I, you know, there are, there are those who do it just because it gets them views. There are those that do it because of a feeling of entitlement. And there are those that do it because that's the brief they were given that week. And it's just, it's, it's quite frustrating when, you know, there's so many others who just want to talk about a show. And the bad, I'm going to call it the bad faith actors are a down for 2023. Because get over yourselves, will you? Particularly, uh, particularly in the context of, yes, I mean, it was announced that Star Trek Discovery was ending and, you know, fireworks were being shot off into the sky. You know, I, I truly hope that you never experience losing a job and somebody then dances on that. To then swing a positive out of that, it does seem like season five of Discovery is going to be an absolute belter because a lot of the clips that we've seen, the cast announcements and perhaps an interview that we've got coming up with one of the principal cast of Star Trek Discovery season five, I said nothing, suggests to me that we are looking for, or looking forward to a very Indiana Jones-esque ride of a series. If it's the last series, that's what I want them to do. I want them to have fun. And we know that they went back and filmed an additional few scenes to make it more of an overall ending. And the, I have no details other than, by all accounts, they gave it the respect and fun that it deserves. And that's what I'm looking forward to. If you remember in February, uh, uh, this small little award show was, was taking place. And because of that small little award show, Oscar winning actress Michelle Yeoh will be heading up the Section 31 long trek. Now, obviously, it's not, it, she's not heading it because she's an Oscar winner. That's just a lovely bonus. We just we get to say Oscar winning actress. Michelle Yeoh won the Oscar for Everything Everywhere All at Once and I was in uh, I was in a bar in LA at the time and there were so many other geeks and nerds around me and when that happened the place erupted because just the support of seeing frankly one of our own win one of the biggest awards of the year was just incredible. Another point during the year, we got to meet people like Marcus as well, which was lovely. A down for this year was the complete lack of anything on First Contact Day. 
Um, you know, Trekkies have been enjoying First Contact Day for a few years now. It's becoming the equivalent of May the 4th for the Star Wars crew. But yes, April the 5th is, you know, it's the handy day to start doing news, things like that. And it was just sort of ignored, really. There was a few pre-recorded um, releases, interviews at fans, which, which was lovely. Now, obviously, there was the huge shadow of something else, which I'll get to momentarily. It, it, it did feel like, oh, okay. That was nothing then. Another thing that has been a wonderful up for 2023 is after so long of discussing it and talking about it, we finally launched our podcast. And thank you so much, everyone, because it sort of hit the ground running. And we had hoped people would listen. We didn't think it was going to do as well as it did. So thank you, which has allowed us to reach out and look at some of the guests. It's been a bit surreal, really. I I'm delighted to say that we already have some guests lined up for 2024, which I cannot wait to share with you. But of course, in the great history of clickbait, you'll have to follow along to find out more. On the spirit then of reinventing and reinvigorating, you've got the announcement of Starfleet Academy. I feel bad for this show already because its announcement was completely swallowed up by everything else this year. It was announced and then Discovery was being cancelled and then Prodigy was being cancelled and then the strike happened and nobody could talk about it. I do think it's important to remember that, obviously, look, we're all, you know, looking for X or Y or Z. There is a new Star Trek show that is confirmed. It is, I think, as of recording, at least the writing is happening again. I, I want and need new Star Trek for this series to continue and to thrive. So this, to me, was an up. The lack of legacy we've covered. I won't belabor the point, but yes, we've belabor, uh, we have explained how that is a down how they were absolutely poised, you know, to go, right, we're going to do a series set in the 25th century. It's going to be great. It had all of its own issues as well, as in, again, the writer strike, so nothing was going to get confirmed during that. Then you had the announcement of Academy anyway, to announce another show would have completely overshadowed that one. Understandable. I think the bit that really puts it into the down is the resounding silence about it. Uh, so at least tell us it's not happening or that discussions are happening, you know? But so far, it's just like... <whistles> hey, you know that petitions reach like 60,000... So that's why it's it's in the demo. We move on then to season two of Strange New Worlds. Take a stank and up the return to the Klingon D7. Take it down. Can anyone just steal an Enterprise at this point? Taken up the inclusion of Carol Kane as Pelia loved her character. Uh, Ad Astra. I need the entire episode is just a beautifully played out courtroom drama. Number three, tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow, you can make plomic soup in a toilet. I uh, loved it. Absolutely flipping loved it. Loved as well how it addressed the incongruities in the timeline and what happens when, where, and why. Really, really liked that. Among the Lotus Eaters was, alas, uh, my least favorite episode of Strange New Worlds this year. Uh, big stinking down for the uniforms were just all wrong, and you know I take umbrage with that. Um, bit of an up, nothing to do with the episode, but filmed that one in the Trek Culture office. That was fun. Oh, poor Ellie got so much verbal abuse that day. For the first time, again, since joining Trek Culture, I visited the office. Yes, I actually went to Gateshead, and I went to the office, and it was wonderful. I got to meet a whole bunch of the people that I've known for years, but we haven't actually interacted. And, you know, myself and Chris got to hang out together again. Most importantly, I got to meet Venkman, so Venkman is his own up. Of course, who else was with us but the fantastic Ellie as well. But it's funny because it's also a moment in time for Trek culture. It was the first time that we'd almost all of us had got together. Still need to get you, Tom. We saw Spock turned human and say, I will break you, Kirk. And then you got the, the, the Lost in Translation episode, which was up, return of Hammer, in a way. And also that beautiful scene that I think gets a little bit overlooked because of so much else this, this year, of Kirk and Uhura discussing what it means to face death in that episode. And that, to me, that was a very special up because that was so well done. Those old scientists the whole episode. Under the Cloak of War, Bob Zolosumakon. Just incredible. And particularly then that exchange between uh, Mbenga and Pike, where Mbenga says, you get the liberty of believing the best in people. That was, that was powerful. Subsace Rhapsody, I mean, where to begin? Cling Pop, uh, the return of Bruce Horak again, which makes me very, very happy. Um, 
Spock's face as Chapel sings with an entire bar full of people about how ready she is to leave him. But really identifying Uhura as the voice of the Enterprise, that mm, mm. And it was such a, Scotty, Martin Quinn, take it on the role of Scotty, brilliant. The trilithium down of the season was how the lack of Ortegas was handled. Obviously, we know that Melissa Navia was not as available this year to be able to film for Ortegas. But uh, the reason it, it's trilithium down is because it wasn't handled very well. Think about the first couple or the first episode where Pike's effectively not in it because Anson Mount was away, they just had a baby, and you know, this was fair enough, and they, they revolved the episode around him. But with Ortegas, they seem to keep teasing more and more and more and then just not delivering. Star Trek Prodigy, with almost no fanfare, is suddenly announced to be. They're, it's being removed from Paramount Plus, they're not going to produce it anymore, asterisk. Uh, but that is definitely a down because they, it's like they swept the legs out from under it before it really got a chance to get going. And it was so frustrating and so, well, frankly, upsetting. At the time, it was the wrong decision. I'm gonna, I will explain why I'm saying at the time as well. They did complete season two. So that was, even in the upset of everything, that was positive because... Well, hang on. They could have just gone, drop tools, stop production. And they didn't do that. So that was something. To, right, well, I'm going to go to, I'm going to jump over now to the, to the up as well. Prodigy being saved. So when I say at the time, it's possible. And it's hope, hopefully, hopefully preferable maybe that now that it's found its home on Netflix and Netflix has, you know, committed to at least uh, putting out season two, that maybe this might be the right place to show it. If you see some of the tweets that, for example, um, Aaron Walke has been putting out since Christmas Day, which is when season one dropped on Netflix, they're, they're, it's climbing up and up the rankings. And the more that we share it, the more that it gets its audience that it deserves, the more likely a season three becomes. So I never would have said this at the time, but maybe it could be a blessing in disguise that it hopped platforms. So I'm going to take the positive from that, that it's doing well on Netflix already. And as of recording, it's been out for two days and it's doing well. So I am, I am optimistic about this. I know we've highlighted this before. I'm highlighting it again. Michelle Stokes and The Plane. I mean, The Plane is just shorthand now for what the fan community can do. Well done. Now, of course, down the strike and the fact that they had to strike. I saw it, do you know what? I, I was watching something here where we were going back through our points and I said, you know, the reason for the strike is valid, which it is, and it's so obviously valid. And, you know, we'd see people going like, you know, oh, you know, these overpaid people and they're just having a whinge. Uh, folks, that is so not the case. You know, your, your Tom Hanks, your Tom Cruises of the world, yeah, they're on millions and millions and millions per film. But if you watch, you know, Michelle Heard explain why the strike was happening for the writers, that so many of them don't earn enough to get healthcare every year. And I do not have the amount of time to go into how silly American healthcare is. Sorry to be controversial, but there's this image that, oh, you're on TV, you've made it. And in a way, sure, but that doesn't mean you financially made it. The reason I'm downing the strike is because selfishly, from a Trekkie's point of view, it's like, come on, we want more Star Trek, ah! But up that they took the initiative, they went out and did it, and I think it's very complicated. There is a resolution. A short clip of season two of Star Trek Prodigy was revealed by the producers at, the, at, at one of the conventions. Up, how gorgeous is that Voyager, A up the return of Robert Picardo as the Doctor. I'm so excited for season two of Prodigy. It's, in a way, everything that happened has helped the conversation around Prodigy because a lot of people have been talking about it. Um, I do wish that these announcements could have been shared in such a way that it wasn't wrapped up in the mire of the cancellation. But now that it's solid, we have a home, we know what's happening, we can dial up the excitement for it again. And then also you have down the very short treks. Star Trek the Animated Series turned 50 this year and to celebrate the anniversary a series of five very short animated episodes were commissioned by Paramount and CBS. They just missed the mark. 
they so they utilized the animated style of the 1970s and that in itself was fun we'd seen other productions like for example gazelle automations having done that scene from threshold and best of both worlds that you can still do that style of animation and still have a lot of fun with it they were brilliant this was entirely new the expectation was that it was going to be fun and it just wasn't for the most part uh, a lot of the humor was lowbrow but not kind of funny lowbrow lowest common denominator humor it's like oh everyone gets offended by everything ha 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 isn't that so funny Come on now, do better. The episode with the blooper reel. Um, there was a fair amount of discussion about this at the time, and the the scene, the only scene from Star Trek Discovery that was included in the very short treks was the scene from the Battle of the Binary Stars that showed the destruction of the USS Europa. In that scene, in the animated uh, segment, you have Saru, Giorgio, and another character all together. Part of the ongoing gaff that the animated series used to have animation mix-ups because of how it was made. They included Saru in his season four uniform, where of course he should have been in his season one uniform. I made the point, which I stand by, that the third character there was someone who they'd obviously swapped in for Burnham. Now, I am well aware that Michael Burnham was not on the bridge when the Europa was destroyed. I know that. But if you're going to include one scene from Star Trek Discovery only, and you're going to remove the one star of Star Trek Discovery, who you think you should see, and include a character who seems like effectively a whitewashed version of that character design, I, I just felt that that was, that was poor form. Now, said it, that's why I'm saying it again. It's, not, I'm not saying an animator decided on a whim to change a character, not at all, I've, and they've made that point. I, I stand by this whopper of a down because you took one scene from Discovery and you cut out Michael Burnham? That's poor form, especially when the placeholder character is clearly inspired by, you know, the hair, the uniform, the look of Burnham. It was a bad, stinking part of a not great celebration. Worst contact exists. Now, I do want to give credit where credit is due. Holograms All the Way Down was a lot of fun. It was brilliant. You know, it was written by Aaron Waltke and it included all aspects of animated and, you know, main Star Trek as well. Star Trek Prodigy got a shout. Taken up. Because also, take a whopping down that as soon as Prodigy was announced to be coming off Paramount Plus, it's like all references to it just stopped. It was weird. Now, I'm sure there's licensing and rights and things like that, da, 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 da. But it was just like, oh, so we're just going to pretend this series doesn't exist? So it was lovely seeing it included in there again. Moving on then into Lower Decks Season 4. Um, so, I mean, again, two Vix, the entire inclusion of Voyager, the Lizard Babies, the Holograms, but particularly Michael Sullivan's... I miss my wife. A whopping down was my green screen in the first episode of uh, season four. I think I put about 10 years on Chris's life there uh, or took them off, whatever way you want to look at it. Yeah, I, I was I was going back and look at the video again just to get notes for this. And it was like, oh, that's pretty bad, Sean. Like, that's pretty bad. One of the up downs of the season, up Mariner's growth down, uh, I, you know, I, I made the point of that. It did feel slightly redundant by season four. It's like, Oh, we're still doing this then. Uh, my point being that in a closed 10 episode season where all words are a premium, I did feel like we were just repeating notes. That to me definitely still stands out as a down. Sure, we, we, get, we get great out of it, half the fun of downs. But yeah, that one was like, oh, really? We're doing this again? Uh, the inclusion of Tillin as a character this season. How brilliant was Gabrielle Ruiz as Tillin? Just how bloody brilliant. The Mark Twain everything. I, I like the Mark Twain impression. I'm not going to lie. Hmm. By that logic, I am, in fact, Vulcan as a mother You got the return of Chase Masterson and Max Grodenschik in Parth Ferengi's Heart Place. Taken up for that one. It was just a brilliant episode. You know, that Ferengi breaking down of the Dominion War Memorial about all the lost prophets. Jeffrey Combs' performance in the episode as Agamus again. Now, whopping up, love that. Taken up to the pure shock of I enjoyed a peanut hamper episode, so that was great. And um, a down for that was how 
smashing together everything felt. I think trying to resolve Pino Humper. P I think trying to resolve, you're so gonna include that in the edit, aren't you? I think trying to include Peanut Hamper and Agamus and Badgie in the one episode, there was just a bit too much going on there. The episode Caves was a lot of fun, but particularly Tendi in the turbo lift, that, what she remembers about her way of trying to get out of this uh, scenario is just when they spent time together. And I really enjoyed that. You have, of course, the return of Robert Duncan McNeil as you know, he looks exactly like Tom Paris, right? Yeah, Nick Locarno. No, I don't see it. Will Wheaton returning as Wesley Crusher for the finale. Shannon Phil coming out of retirement to play Cito Jackson. Again, my down for the previous episode where the sudden inclusion of Mariner into Cito, you know, Cito was such a core part of why Mariner is the way that she is. That felt very forced. Uh, but it did give us this scene. This is what I mean, you know, something good coming out of it. Down. Down. Oh yeah, my best friend Cito, who I knew the whole time. Ah, good old Cito, yeah. You have literally never mentioned her before today. Do you know what it is? It's like the Doctor never referring to any other companions in Doctor Who. So actually. But yes, Cito uh, arriving. And, because I missed her at the time, up the silent Jean Hajar cameo in the beginning of the finale. Now, thank you very much for pointing her out to me. And of course, the Steamrunner class ship getting its moment and Mariner saying after everyone, yeah, Star Trek makes mistakes all the time, but I believe in the mission. A whole year, folks, I've probably, I've probably missed or not given enough attention to, but if there's one final thing that I want to bring attention to, it's how flipping special this year has felt. It's felt like there's been a lot of adversity this year between all of the various challenges that Star Trek has faced, but I think that we've come to the end of it in a slightly bruised, but togetherness. What are your ups and downs of the year? Do you have anything that I have obviously forgotten? Do you have any that you feel, oh, I could include that? Or do you have any that I feel, we need some downs? Let us know in the comments below. Folks, thank you so much. Our podcast is ongoing. We should have a new episode dropping this week. We will have a new episode next week as well. And then the, myself and Tom will return two weeks after this drops, I believe. Who knows? That might change. But we're coming back anyway. That'll be out on Tuesdays. I hope you had a lovely Christmas, uh, however you celebrate it. I hope you had a lovely December in general. Have a wonderful New Year's. Let's all go into 2024 with a sense of excitement for what is coming. You are awesome. You are amazing. Thank you, Chris, for editing this. Remember, you can follow him at Edit Chris Edit on the various socials. Follow us at, at Trek Culture on Twitter and Blue Sky and TikTok and at Trek Culture YT on Instagram. I'm at Sean Ferrick on the various socials. You are wonderful. I love you all. Simply, simplest way of putting it. Even when we're bumping heads, I'd rather do that with another Trekkie than not at all. So live long and prosper. Thank you all. Slav Ukraina. And to everyone out there, be safe, be kind to yourselves, lead with kindness. We're all a bit quick to snap. So let's take a breath and go, how can we make a situation more positive than it was before? And I think if we do that, we're gonna have a pretty good 2024. Make it so.